Uh, the name of this message is called Jesus Christ is Coming to Town. Amen? All right. Turn your Bibles to Matthew uh, chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. In fact, uh, we've been through this passage before in Matthew 2. It's when uh, the wise men come and, and uh, bestow their gifts upon uh, the Messiah, baby Jesus. And we've looked at it before from a historical perspective and even to, de- to a degree from a spiritual perspective. And uh, I want to look at it, make like three different passes through it uh, today and look at it in a little bit more depth than perhaps we've looked at it ever before, uh, at least from a more prophetic perspective. I want to look at it first from a historical perspective and what's, being, what's happening here. Uh, and then I want to look at it from a spiritual perspective, uh, some of those things that don't immediately meet the eye that are going on spiritually behind the scenes here. Uh, and then I want to look at it thirdly and lastly from a prophetic perspective. A prophetic perspective, uh, meaning what does this mean prophetically as in regard to our future? Because there's a whole lot in the Bible. I mean, somebody, you know, who, somebody could read through the Bible and say, yeah, I've read the Bible. But if you don't understand the Bible from its historical perspective, from its spiritual perspective, and from its prophetic perspective, you're really not getting out of the Bible what God intends us to receive from it. And it is such a rich mine of truth that uh, a thousand lifetimes would not be sufficient to glean everything that we need. Or I shouldn't say that we need. It gives us, even today, what we need. But it wouldn't be sufficient enough to have a, a, a perfect understanding of Scripture. And uh, a lot of pastors, a lot of teachers will go through various passages of Scripture uh, this Christmas morning, and I know their hearts, and my heart as well, is that we might come to know Jesus better. But sometimes I feel like uh, we just, if we just look at the surface of the text, and we don't realize what it means on, on a, in our lives, and we don't realize what it means in the future, uh, we don't realize what it's speaking to us spiritually about the own ba- our own battles that we'll face, we're going to be in trouble. We'll just, you know, we'll leave with just, wow, okay, wise men gave Jesus gifts, that's cool, you know, and uh, you know, Herod stood up. Yeah, that guy was a wicked man. But we need to know there's more to it. There's a lot going on. And even in the Christmas story, it's so heavy when you really look at it. And look at verse, chapter 2, verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, magi, or wise men from the east, arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east. And I've come to worship him. Now it's interesting because Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And you'll remember that God supernaturally uh, moved him to Bethlehem because of the census that was taken for tax purposes. God used uh, the the political situation of the day and the geography and what have you to make sure that his son was born in Bethlehem. And, you know, Mary and Joseph had taken him there uh, because that's where she had originated and so forth. They had originated Uh, And it's interesting when you think about it because God will move heaven and earth to get his work done. And in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, one of the prophecies about the coming Jewish Messiah would be that he would be born in Bethlehem. And it's fitting because Bethlehem was the city of the great King David, amen? And Messiah, Jesus, would be a descendant of King David. Both Mary and Joseph uh, were descendants of King David, and the Messiah would sit on King David's throne. And Bethlehem is where King David uh, Uh, was a shepherd and what have you. And it's interesting because it's in Bethlehem, and I've been there before. You can't really go there now. My first trip to Israel, I went to Bethlehem, and it's astonishing. I mean, just on your trip there, it's like this little rock town. You know, it looks like it's made of of, of just like, you know, limestone or something, or a bit brighter, more of a white stone. And and you just, it's it's amazing. There's these shepherd's fields all around, and it's just this crisp, at least the time I went, this is beautiful air and uh, in the fields, and there's nomads and what have you, just still to this day, shepherds tending the sheep. David was not only a king, but first he was a shepherd. And it's out of Bethlehem that the sheep were born and raised that would go to Jerusalem for uh, the sacrifices according to the Jewish law. And it's there that Jesus was born, amen? Because he was the ultimate, not sheep only, but or I should say shepherd only, but he was also the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. So it's fitting that he be born in Bethlehem. By the way, Bethlehem also means what? They remember? The meaning is house of bread. Praise God. Amen. It means house of bread. And Jesus is the bread of life, the bread that's come down from heaven. And you know what? We're never going to get through the historical, are we? Okay. And so I better just shoot through chapter two, and then we'll get into the spiritual and also the prophetic. 
Lord help me, saying a bunch of things I didn't plan on saying. Okay, verse two. It's interesting now in verses one and two that they are magi. Okay, these were guys who were like astrologers, you know, they were, and astrologers in those days weren't simply like the astrologers today who just, you know, make up a bunch of things about, you know, what the stars mean and so forth for some kind of spiritual application, which is actually forbidden in scripture, but they blended a lot of science. They were more astronomers, but they were also, many of them were given over to superstitions as well. It's interesting that these guys have come from the East, uh, and the same word that's used, uh, the same description is used of those men in the book of Daniel. You remember the book of Daniel where you had those, uh, the magi or the astrologers who were standing against Daniel and, and, and uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and, and were withstanding them? Well, it, it's like, well, where did these guys come from and how come they've come to worship the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah? Well, it goes back, I believe, to the book of Daniel because it's in the book of Daniel that God reveals the timing of the Messiah's coming, his first coming. The Bible speaks of two different comings of Messiah. The first one to take care of our sins. The first one to die for you and me upon the cross. And we read about that in Isaiah 53 and other passages, but we also read about it in the book of Daniel. And Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, actually gives a timeline. And it talks about 69 sevens and then a seventh seven. And it says that 69 sevens of time would take place and then Messiah would be cut off. And we're told by Daniel that that time would, would start from the decree to rebuild uh, Jerusalem, uh, to rebuild the temple. And we read in Nehemiah chapter 2 that King Artaxerxes commissioned uh, Nehemiah, who was a cupbearer and who was sad that day. And he said, Nehemiah, why, why is your countenance down? Because if you're a king, you don't want your cupbearer to look bad. If he looks like he's dying, that means you might die. And Daniel, or Nehemiah said, because my people are in exi- exile here. And he commissioned him to be able to go back to Israel and to rebuild the temple. And then we know the dates. You could look in secular encyclopedias to see the date. It was 445, 444 uh, B.C., right around that time. Well, guess what? You start counting 360-day years, which is a time uh, amount of days for a prophetic year in the book of uh, Daniel, and it brings you right to the crucifixion of Christ. And it says after those 69 sevens, the Messiah would be cut off. He'd be cut off. And Isaiah says he'd be cut off from the land of the living. He'd become our, a sin offering for us. And that brings you, so right in the book of Daniel, a book that was written in, during Babylonian captivity, uh, the, and get you, you know, you understand, they were tripping out on Daniel. Nobody else could interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream. They were realizing, hey, this guy really knows God. We're involved in this magic and stuff, but we are not connected to God because they were connected with a false God. So it's understood that, many, uh, that these things were passed down through the ages. And these Gentiles had an idea of when the Messiah would come. And if he would be executed, for, uh, be, be treated with capital punishment, you know, uh, it, you know, not too many years between AD and BC or after uh, his birth, obviously he would have to grow into a man. So they knew that he would be coming on the scene and born somewhere around that time. And then being men who looked to the stars, they saw something different than they'd ever seen before. They saw a star, but it wasn't really a star as they understood stars, and we understand stars, but it was something that was moving, you see. Because if you pay close attention to the narrative, you'll see that they followed the star, and it moved. And it ultimately stood over where Jesus was born. Uh, So we're not talking about a star uh, in the cosmos, uh, like a sun, we're talking about perhaps the Shekinah glory of God, perhaps the very power of, of God, uh, either something he made that wasn't himself or the revelation of his own power as he led them, uh, even as God had led the children of Israel with a cloud. Remember that? A pillar by night, cloud in, uh, in the daytime. He, he led them with a star. And it wasn't according to astrology, you know, you know, this, you know, stars in this house and what have you. It was actual movement, which would probably be a farther proximity to our atmosphere that led them there, which I think is quite interesting. And he says, you want to follow the stars? Well, I'm going to give you a new star, and I don't want you to worship the stars. I'm going to lead you with the star to the one you're to worship, the Messiah that's written about when Daniel was in captivity. So quite interesting when we see, because it says in verse 2 that they've come to worship him. Verse 3, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, 
and all Jerusalem with him. You could bet that Herod was troubled because Herod was an Edomite. And the Edomites, they weren't Jews. In fact, they were the enemies of the Jews. And Herod had been placed there as a leader by the Roman authorities. And he would be troubled because guess what? If a king was being born, right? That would mean his kingship was in jeopardy along with all those who ruled with him. Verse 4, gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them, where is the Messiah? Uh, Where is my Messiah to be born? And they said to him, verse 5, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And then he quotes, uh, and you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Now it's interesting because verse 7 says, Then Herod secretly called the Magi, and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. Verse 8, And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. Verse 9, After hearing the king, they went their way. And the star which they had seen in the east went on before them. You notice it moved. It went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. You see, this was not your normal star. Verse 10, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshiped him. And they worshiped him. I love that, man. Because throughout Matthew, throughout the Gospels, Throughout the New Testament, you see Jesus Christ being worshipped. However, we're told over and over and over and over again that we're only to worship God, amen? Remember, you remember that when Satan wanted Jesus to worship him, Jesus said, you know, get behind me, Satan is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and serve him only. And we see that throughout scriptures. We've looked at many passages like that. Yet over and over again, we see Jesus being worshipped and we never see him saying, don't worship me. In fact, when John bows down to worship an angel, what happens? twice in Revelation. Remember? The angel says, don't worship me. I'm a servant like you. Worship God. Yet God in Hebrews chapter 1 commands, in Hebrews 1, for the angels to worship who? Jesus, it says. Read Hebrews chapter 1. That's because Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Word who is with the Father from the beginning. He is God. The Scriptures say that He made all things. Without Him, nothing was made that was made. They worshiped Him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. That's why people think there were three wise men, because there's three gifts mentioned here. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh, which are all beautiful gifts and have meaning to them. And we'll look at that more when we look at the prophetic. Verse 12, and having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. Now when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt. He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. Now it's quite interesting because Herod wanted to worship, so he said, the Messiah like the Magi. Yet he set out to kill them, kill them. Herod was a brutal man, okay? He was a very, very wicked man. This is Herod the Great. There's different Herods, just like, you know, there's different popes. There's, Herod was a title, and this is Herod the Great. You'll read about another Herod of the book of Acts who, uh, you know, committed some of the first martyrdoms against the church. But this is Herod the Great. Herod the Great was a little, real little guy, four foot four, man. He was four foot four, but he had a huge ego, and he wanted to prove that he was a big superstar, so he built palaces, he built fortresses. He built Mossad, if you've ever been to Mossad. When we make our Israel trip, uh, we hope to go up to Mossad. It was pretty radical. It's a huge story with Mossad. Uh, he built aqueducts. He, uh, he refurbished and, and, and rebuilt. Uh, well, I should say he, uh, you know, added to the temple. I mean, he was known for that. Many of the Jews praised him because of the work that he had done in the temple. But he was a wicked man. I mean, he killed his wife. Uh, He killed three of his sons, his own sons. Killed three of them. 
In fact, uh, Caesar Augustus said that it's safer to be one of Herod's pigs than to be one of his sons. He could imagine. So he had a reputation as being a very, very brutal man. And he was not loved ultimately toward the end of his reign. And, and because he wanted people to mourn his death, and he didn't think people would, he had a hundred uh, Jewish leaders uh, arrested and, and wanted them killed right, after, right when he died. That way at least people were mourning the day he died. Well, uh, they captured a hundred men and they didn't put him to death though. I mean, after they, Herod died, they, they let him go, thank God. Uh, so from a historical perspective as the Edomite, we can see him as, and as a king who wants to be exalted, we can see him as wanting to be worshipped and standing against the newborn king, uh, realizing, wow, there's something prophetic going on here. But we want to look a little bit deeper. We want to look at the spiritual. And we also want to look at the prophetic because uh, when you start to, this isn't just a historical thing that happens. It has rhyme and reason to it that relates to us today. Of course, it relates to us today historically because God safeguarded his son, amen, to be born in the world and then die for our sins. But looking at it a little bit more deeply from a spiritual perspective, we have to keep in mind that we wrestle not, the Bible says, against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and the powers and the rules of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. And there's something spiritually going on behind the scenes. There's something spiritually going on behind the scenes. So you really can't appreciate what this says just from a historical perspective unless you understand what's happening spiritually behind the scenes. And then you can't fully understand what's happening historically and spiritually behind the scenes until you understand what's happening from a prophetic perspective. And I hope you'll understand uh, Matthew chapter 2, the passage that we just read, verses 1 through 14, like never before. Uh, Turn to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. And when you get there, I want you to look at, just go ahead and look at verse 1. And we read about a woman here. And we read about Israel. And we read about uh, a son. And we read about a son that someone's trying to kill. In chapter 12, verse 1, a great sign appeared in the heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. And she was with child. And she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. So in Revelation 12, we see this glorious woman, you know, uh, clothed with the sun and the moon and, and 12 stars, you know, this crown. And, and who is this woman? And now the Roman Catholic Church says this is Mary. Okay, this is a picture of Mary in all of her beauty. And Mary, we should pray to her and say so many Hail Marys a day and all this stuff. But it's not Mary. In fact, how do we know this is Mary? Well, a Roman Catholic would say because whatever the, you know, the Roman Catholic Church says it is, it must be because many of them bow to tradition. You know, and they bow to the church. But we know that the Bible is its own best interpreter, amen? And we believe in sola scriptura, solely scripture, amen? Nothing trumps scripture, amen? The Bible says the scripture is, is sufficient, and we test everything by the scripture, including the traditions of men and their interpretations. Well, who is the woman here? The woman is Israel, the Bible is its own best interpreter. In fact, there are hundreds of allusions in the book of Revelation to Old Testament passages that throw light on what uh, God is saying in the book of Revelation. And you'll remember, how did Israel start? Through Abraham, the patriarch. Abraham was the first Jew. And that God said, through his seed, the nations of the world will be blessed. And he had Isaac and then Jacob, right? Now, it's interesting Jacob had 12 sons, and those 12 sons, Benjamin and, and Joseph, and, and you know, we, you know we've got, we can name all 12 of the sons. We've studied them before. Through these 12 sons, we have the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes that make up Israel. In fact, we just read about the place of Judah, right? Judah was one of the 12 sons, and the land of Judah was the land that was apportioned to Judah because God segmented his uh, Israel out in, uh, according to each tribe. And it's interesting because the 12 tribes of Israel, they made up Israel. Who was the father of the 12 tribes? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob immediately, right? Jacob's name was changed to what? Israel. And he has these 12 sons. And it's interesting because Joseph, who was rejected by his brothers, and he was the favorite son of his father, and rejected and ended up feeding Egypt bread and then finally get, bring it home to his own people who rejected him, which is a marvelous, wonderful picture of Jesus. We've talked about that before. 
And that's about the shortest way I've ever summed up his story, because I need to move on. But uh, he, it's just, to me, it's such a beautiful story. But it's interesting because we see a picture of Jesus there, but in that Joseph came out of those 12 tribes, right? As a picture of Messiah. But think about this for a moment. Joseph had a dream. And in his dream, what was bowing down to him? Do you remember? The sun and the moon and what? 12 stars. And it's explained and we see there that later on, the very brothers that rejected him, his father, his family, end up bowing down to him, recognizing God's work in his life. Remember that? As he gives them bread because he's risen to the right hand of Pharaoh in the land of Egypt and God had favor upon him. And they bow down to him as 12 brothers. And, you know, there's the newborn, there was a newborn brother as well. And, and you have not only them bowing down to him, but his dad recognizing, wow, look what's happened here is his mother. So uh, now, who were those? And they were, in his dream, it was 12 stars and the sun and the moon bowing down to him. Later, it was fulfilled in his family. Who did the 12 stars and the sun and the moon represent? Israel. Israel, amen? That's why you have to read Scripture and you can't just go by an interpretation. If I tell you, hey, this means this, this means that, you don't see it in the Scripture, don't believe it. If any man tells you something means something, but you don't see it in the Word of God, we need to be in the Word. And in chapter 12, verse 1, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. And over and over again in the Old Testament, Israel is called the wife of God, depicted as a woman. She's divorced under the old covenant, and there needs to be a new covenant made through the son of David, who's pictured by Joseph, who was rejected. In verse 2, and she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. She has a child, this woman, Israel, and she's crying out to give birth. Who does the Bible tell us that the Messiah would come through? What nation? What people? Through Israel. The Messiah would come through Israel. And so he did. He was born as a child of Abraham, specifically from the tribe of Judah, specifically from the line of Jesse and David. Verse 3, Then another sign appeared in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems. Okay? Now, these heads and horns represent the governments of the earth that stand against Christ. Uh, the dragon represents Satan. Oh, I just said, hey, you know, don't believe it when a man says something about what they represents. You've got to see it in Scripture. Well, look at verse 9. And the great dragon, let's see, was thrown down, the serpent of old, who was called the devil and what? Satan, who deceives the whole world. And he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. So, he sees Satan, and, and you can read about this, these tent horns and heads in Revelation 17. They show you that they're government leaders and, and kingdoms and so forth. Verse 4, and his tail swept a third of the stars of heaven and threw them down to the earth. The stars are angels. In fact, we read in Revelation chapter 1, 18 through 20, and, and then if you go through chapter 2 and 3, that you'll see that stars signify angels. And you'll see later in this passage that Satan is thrown down with his angels. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth. So when the woman, who's the woman? Israel. She's about to give birth. Who specifically in Israel? What woman specifically was about to give birth? It's the woman Israel, but it was through the line of David, and it was who? Mary. Stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might what? Devour her child. What was Herod trying to do? when he found out that the Messiah had come into the world, trying to destroy Jesus. So when we look at Matthew chapter 2, we see the historical. We see Herod. We see a wicked, evil, brutal tyrant. Yet when you realize what's going on, Herod's just a man. He's just a puppet. Satan is using his aspirations and his selfish ambitions to be exalted above God and be worshipped himself by the people. And he's using that as a temptation to motivate him to murder. I mean, he killed his own sons. He'll certainly kill somebody else's. So what you need to do is see, wow, there's the, there's the historical, but there's a spiritual dynamic taking place in the heavenly realms of demonic principalities and powers at work. So Satan is there to devour her child. Verse 5, and she gave birth to a son, a male child, 
who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Who's that child? Who's going to rule all the nations with a rod of iron? Jesus says in Revelation 2 and 3, you can read also in uh, Acts, or I'm sorry, Psalm chapter 2 and other places, he's going to rule with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. It's interesting because Satan could not put him to death early on. And then when Satan was able, and Jesus called it the hour of darkness, you know, was able to inspire people to crucify Christ, what happened? It, it blew up in his face because God's own crucifixion, God becoming man, when he was crucified, he paid for our sins, amen? And then he rose from the dead three days and three nights later, and he ascended to the Father, and that is how we get our victory, amen? Now, she gave birth to a son, a male child who was to rule the nations, verse 5, with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. The Bible says now that Jesus, now Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father, and we now await his second coming. Verse 6, then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God, so that there she would be nourished for 1,260 days. Now we move from the historical to the spiritual, now to the prophetic. There's something really heavy going on here. And now we're going to have to tie all three together, really. But it's interesting because what's that 12, I'm sorry, what's that 1,260 days? That's a three and a half year period. Do you remember that we talked about the Magi could know around the time the Messiah would be born. They wouldn't know the exact year, but as soon as they knew it was coming, and during that time they were observant, and then they see this new star in the heavenlies, and it's not a normal star. It's something that moves them over to Bethlehem, and they, they know, uh, you know that this is where, remember Daniel? They talked about the rebuilding the temple and God bringing back to the land. They knew it's in that area where God's people live, and they go there, and a heavy thing goes on. Those 69 sevens were already fulfilled. Because there'd be 69 sevens, which is 483 years, which when you count from 445 to 4, uh, or 444, the scholars debate as which it is, it brings you to Christ's crucifixion. Well, guess what? There's one seven left. We call it the 70th week of Daniel. And it's what the early church fathers taught. They talk about Daniel's last week in the second and third century is still yet to be fulfilled in the future. There was that seven year period of time that sometimes we call the tribulation period. And you say, well, this is a three and a half year period of time. Yes, we call the last three and a half years the great tribulation period because that is the second half of that last seven year period that's to be fulfilled. The first 69 have already been fulfilled. The Messiah was cut off. And the first 69 would be fulfilled before his first coming. The last seven will be fulfilled before his second coming. However, that, first, that last week, that 70th week is going to be split in half because it talks about a time when the temple will be rebuilt and the Jews will again be able to worship God and, and it says that they'll have grain offerings and so forth and that in the middle of the seven years those grain offerings will be put to stop by the Antichrist and that he will sit in the temple of God showing himself that he is God and he'll want to be worshipped and all hell will break loose. So that's why uh, she's nourished for 1,260 days. That's why she flees, verse 6, into the wilderness. Because when the Antichrist appears on the scene, it says very clearly, Jesus told the, the first Christians in Matthew chapter 24, when you see the abomination, Matthew 24, 15, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, the temple, he said, flee to the mountains. Flee to the mountains. So when the Antichrist takes up shop and he enforces people to take the mark of the beast, 666, on their right hand or on their forehead to buy or sell, Christians are forbidden to take that mark. And he will go after Jews, okay, and he will go after uh, those who put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you are a Christian who looks at things from the historical, from the spiritual, and from the prophetic, you'll be able to recognize things, these things when they happen. If you ignore Bible prophecy, you won't. Jesus said to those who miss his first coming, he said, you know when the sky is red and everything, you know that rain is coming, you know? And he says, yet you have not realized the time of your visitation, the first coming of Christ. And he said about his second coming, you know when the fig tree buds, you know that summer's near. And these signs, he said to his followers, will show you the signs of the end times, the second coming, will show you that I'm at the door. And we're seeing many of those signs fulfilled before our eyes right now. We need to be awake. We need to be aware. We need to recognize the prophetic because guess what? The, the Magi got it before the Jewish leaders got it. You understand? 
And that means that's a picture of many, many people professing faith in Christ in the end times who aren't looking for a second coming, but are looking for some earthly kingdom. Because that's what many of the Jewish leaders wanted, an earthly kingdom. And that's what's happening in the church right now. A lot of people are getting their eyes off the second coming of Christ, their eyes off of what the Bible reveals, and they're starting saying, hey, let's get the kingdom now. Let's, let's take over the political arena on earth and, and enforce our faith on everybody else and usher in the millennial period of Christ. We're ushering the new heaven and the new earth. And that's not biblical, man. That's not biblical. We need to stand up and be counted and, and occupy till he comes and stand up for righteousness and truth. Amen. And even with the governments of the earth, say this is right, this is wrong. And vote our conscience. But don't be deluded into thinking that we will take over the earth for Christ. That's not from God. And that's, that's exactly what happened in Hitler's Nazi Germany. A lot of them thought, hey, this is, they called it the thousand year Reich, you know, the reign of Christ. But they replaced the cross with a swastika and it was a big deception. It was all antichrist. We need to stick to Jesus, amen? So she flees into the wilderness. And verse 7 says, And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who was called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He accuses them before God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. They did not love their life even when faced with death. For this reason rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in in them. Woe to the earth and, and the sea because the devil has come down to you having great wrath knowing that he has only a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman, that's Israel, who gave birth to the male child. But, the, but check this out. The two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place where she was nourished for a time and times and half a time. A time is one year. Times is two years, and then half a time. So you have a year, and then two more years, that's three, and then half a time, that's three and a half years, which matches the uh, 1,200 and some days that we read about earlier. And the times and half a time uh, from the presence of the serpent. And the serpent poured out water like a river out of his mouth after the woman, so that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and drank up the river, which the dragon poured out of his mouth. So the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children. Who's that? Check it out. Who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. That's the believers. And then in Revelation 13, 5, he makes war against the saints. And it talks about the coming Antichrist and the false prophet that Satan energizes to bring uh, worship to the Antichrist. The false prophet does signs by bringing fire down from heaven and causes everybody, verses 16 through 18 in Revelation 13, to take a marker on their right hand or their forehead or they can't buy or sell. And later we find out that people are beheaded that don't take the mark of the beast. By the way, what's the popular way for these radical Muslims to kill people these days, you know? It's beheading, Okay. And it says everyone who doesn't love the truth of who Jesus is as Messiah will be given over to strong delusion under the Antichrist. Many of these people will become armies under the Antichrist, I believe, personally. And this war is heavy, man. The, what we see going on right now is heavy because we're looking at the historical, now we're also looking at the spiritual, and now we're looking at the prophetic. And when you think about it prophetically, there is a whole lot going on. Why? Because way back in the book of Genesis, when man turned from God, and Satan tried to deceive the first humans uh, and put a cloak of darkness over to Adam and Eve and death, and they were kicked out of Eden, and entropy, decay has set into the human race. When that happened, God already stepped in and said he had a plan to redeem mankind. Do you remember that? And he pronounced judgment upon the serpent and Satan who used the serpent. And he pronounced judgment upon the human race. But he also pronounced a coming blessing, his promise of redemption. And he told The woman, and indirectly told the evil one, Satan, you know, he did tell the enemy as well. He told the woman that she would bear a seed. That a seed would come out of the woman, eventually. 
and there would be a seed from the serpent, who ultimately will be Antichrist. The seed of the woman ultimately is Jesus Christ. And the seed of the serpent would bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He was bruised. His heel was bruised. You know, but guess what? Death could not hold him down, amen? But it says the seed of the woman, Jesus Christ, would crush the head of the serpent, would do the enemy in. And that's a glorious, glorious truth. And that's prophetic. So now, guess what? Satan knows from the very early chapters of Genesis that a seed is coming, right? A seed is coming from a woman. Eve was a woman, but it was to be narrowed down to Israel, who's depicted as that woman with 12 stars, the sun and the moon. And then it would be narrowed down, <clears throat> excuse me, even more to a woman named Mary, a virgin. And she'd have to be a virgin because it wouldn't just be a son of Mary who would be the son of David. It would be the son of God, amen? Not just human, but from the Father, from the Holy Spirit, the Word who was with the Father from the beginning, who was not human, who was with God uh, fr- from eternity past. And she'd be a virgin because I've t- told, we talked about it last Thursday. What, where do you get your blood type from? From what sex? From mother or father? From your father. Okay, Jesus' blood would have to be pure. And his father would have to be God who is the spirit. Amen? And uh, his blood would be pure because we can't die for each other and our blood is sinful. We're sinners and the Bible says life is in the blood and if you give a, a, a hemophiliac blood from an AIDS patient, that hemophiliac will die. Well, guess what? We all have spiritual AIDS, every human being. We're all dead because our blood is tainted. We have the, the sentence of death written in our bodies. We decay, even though we've been created to live forever. But Jesus Christ had pure blood, and he was the God-man, amen? And he laid down his life in our place, amen? So praise God for that. Now, it gets heavier because there's still this war going on. Satan could not stop that seed from coming, but he tried. How many times did he try? He knew his days were numbered as soon as it was stated that the woman's seed would crush his head. So he did everything he could to keep that seed from coming. He knows, even in Revelation 12, it talks about how he knows his days are short during the tribulation period when he's cast down. In the middle of that seven years, he's cast down. He empowers the Antichrist during the middle of seven years to lay the slaughter against the Jews and against the Christians. Why? Why is it going, what's going on there? Why is Satan still trying to wipe out Israel? Why is he still trying to wipe out the church? Why is he, why is so much in the media when Christians are encouraging people to love their neighbor as themselves and love God with their whole heart, soul, mind, and strength and do unto others as you'd have them do unto you and are teaching against the lies that we live, we're in a jungle and we're all supposed to get what's best for us and trample on the other person for the so-called survival of the fittest and that that's a lie. And why are Christians who are teaching love and truth, why are they the most persecuted people when they've built more hospitals than any group on earth you know more more orphanages than any person on earth you can go to countries that did not have hospitals and they didn't have orphanages all over the planet why because satan is behind the scenes and raging the lost against those who love the truth and what's remarkable when you think about all of this think about it think about it from the very beginning he tried to stop the seed from coming he tried to mix up sarah and hagar you remember that He didn't want that seed to come. Through Pharaoh, he tried to exterminate the Jews, and they were held captive there for 400 plus years. And he tried to wipe them out, okay? You remember on the way to the promised land, the Midianites tried to exterminate them. You remember that. You remember that Balak, the king, paid Balaam money so he could put a curse on Israel and wipe them out as a people. That was not just happening. Just like you read about Herod, but you see there's a spiritual dimension behind it. There's a spiritual dimension behind all these things we're talking about where Satan was alive and well, moving against God's people because he wanted to wipe out the woman because he didn't want the seed to be born because the seed, Jesus, would crush his head. Are you with me? That's what was going on there. And even, man, even, you know, when they're in the promised land, he brought wave upon wave, army upon army through that territory to wipe them out. And he couldn't wipe them out, so he tried to lead them into sin. And, and that way God would have to punish them. And they, they went into sin several times. God led them into a diaspora or dispersion. They were dispersed upon throughout the earth and held in exile in Babylon and Persia and various places. But God made promises to Abraham that that seed would come. So God would chasten them and bring them to repentance, bring them back into the land. And even when they were uh, 
during Diaspora, when they were in other lands. You remember Haman? Do you remember Haman? Tried to wipe out the Jews again. Anybody read the book of Esther? There's a new movie out there called One Night with the King, which kind of which goes through that story. Uh, it came out about a year ago or so. And Haman, you know, he ends up dying on his own gallows, the gallows that he had built to hang Mordecai. And Haman ends up meeting the hangman himself because what Satan means for evil, God always turns around. I love that about God, how he just takes what Satan means for evil and just turns it around. And you find Haman hanging on his own noose. So over and over again, there's wave upon wave of persecution trying to destroy. And then even when Jesus is about to come on the scene, what does Herod try to do? Kill every child that's under a couple years old, trying to keep the seed. See, Satan was trying to keep the seed from coming. Then the seed's there. And when Jesus is contacting, uh, or when he's, in, uh, when, when he's getting in touch with people that are demon-possessed to deliver them from demons, the demons, will, they have fear, they have trembling. Are you, are you come here before your, t- uh, you know, before your time to torment us? You know, before our time. They knew their time was coming up. And all of a sudden, God in the flesh, the one that they saw in heaven, is now the God-man, and he has a plan. They don't understand it fully. And they tried to keep him from following God's will. If you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. When he's on the cross, one of the thieves, if you're the son of God, an echo from Satan. You have to see this deception, the spiritual aspect. If you're the son of God, get off the cross. Trying to get him to deny. Well, if he's not going to get off the cross, try to get him to deny while God, while he's on the cross, he doesn't. And the cross, which is the most brutal thing that's happened in history, becomes the most beautiful thing that's happened in history. That's why you have this huge cross behind me, because it's through the cross that God's plan was to take what Satan meant for evil and that he would give his son and that he himself would pour, God himself would pour his wrath on his son that we deserved so we wouldn't have to be under the wrath that Satan, the position that Satan put us in through deceiving us to turn away from God. And everyone here, everyone in the world has turned from God. We all deserved his wrath. So God used that to save us. However, it's not over. It's not over. The seed triumphed. It's over in the sense that he paid for our sins. But this battle, the spiritual battle, continues to have a prophetic dimension because Satan's object, objective still this day is to destroy the seed and to destroy the people of the seed. Do you understand that? That's his objective. It's still his objective today. And we need to understand that. In fact, it's interesting, when you look at Haman back in the book of Esther, he was an Agagite. He was a son of Agag. Remember Agag? They were the enemies of God. When you look at Herod here, he's an Edomite. The Edomites were the descendants of Esau. And this Herod, who's king right now, is who? He's an Edomite. The enemy of the the, the people that tried to destroy God's people long ago. And right now, to this day, there are enemies of God's people and enemies of Israel that want to wipe Israel off the map. Why? I mean, long, I mean, decades ago, the big, I mean, World War II, what was that about? That was about a demon-possessed man named Adolf Hitler who tried to exterminate the Jews. He went into 20 countries, not just, not just Germany. He wasn't even Germany, he was Austrian. He went to Poland and to Italy and to France. He went to all these different countries looking for Jews to exterminate them. Do you think that was just Hitler having hatred for Jews? No, there's a spirit behind that. There's a spirit behind anti-Semitism. And it's, there's more to the picture than meets the eye. It's demonic because Satan wants to fuel that. Right now, there's a huge uprising throughout Europe against the Jews. Did you know that? And it's growing here as well. It's not an accident, you guys. Why? Because if Herod could wipe out the Jewish kids, he'd keep the seed from coming. Prior to that, if he could wipe out the Jewish people, the woman, right, it would keep the seed from coming. Well, what chance do you have a victory now? Well, the prophecies are that Jesus Christ is coming back for his people, Amen that the Jews would be brought back into the land, which they were, that fulfilled prophecy, and that Jesus Christ is coming back to, for his people, and he's going to stand at his feet on the Mount of Olives there in Israel. Well, guess what? If you wipe out Israel, if you wipe out the Jews, and if you wipe out the Christians, guess what? You keep prophecy from coming to pass. There's nothing, I mean, how can Christ come back to his people? There's nothing to come back for. You following that? So he's trying to deter the sea from coming back again. You have Ahmadinejad over there, the president of Iran, the leader of Iran, what does he want? He said he wants, he w- wants Israel to be wiped off the face of the earth. Okay? And they're waiting. You know why he's doing that? Because they're waiting for their Islamic Messiah to set up camp. 
And where have many of the radical Muslims have claimed to be one of their holiest sites? We think of Mecca, we think of the Kaaba, but guess what? One of the holiest sites for them now, it wasn't in the past, is right there on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Where Christ will reign in the future. But now you have the, the black dome and the golden dome, you know, dome of the rock. And in that dome it says that Allah is God. And it says that he has no son. Why'd they write that? First John chapter 2 and 1 John chapter 4 tell us that every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, the spirit of Antichrist. And 1 John 2 says that he who denies the Father and the Son, this is Antichrist. And the Bible tells us that the Antichrist will sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And this battle is still raging because Satan wanted to build his, he said he wanted to exalt himself above God on the sides of the north in the heavenly realm and be worshiped. He's been cast out. So during the tribulation period, the closest he can get to that is where? On the temple mount. Where it says the Lord Jesus will suddenly come to his temple. But there'll be a counterfeit Christ first called the Antichrist who will sit in the temple of God showing people that he is God. Trying to be worshipped. And Satan will come after the woman and he'll come after the Christian to exterminate them. And that spirit is raging. You have, we, there's so much to this, you guys. It's, it's alive and well and growing. And so many Christians, so many Christians have their head in the sand, not recognizing what's going down, what's happening. That there is a demonic spirit alive and well that's raging against the church. And we're getting so caught up in other things, not recognizing that we need to reach the lost. We need to tell people what the truth is. It's crazy when you think about it. Now, I'll tell you what, uh, I think Herod's a prophetically kind of a trip because like the Antichrist, think of the parallels between Herod and the Antichrist. Like Herod, Herod was a king. He was Herod the Great, the great king in that area. Antichrist, it's called the king of first first countenance. Uh, Number two, like Antichrist, Herod first to be, appeared to be quite religious, didn't he? He said to be like a good guy. Oh, let me know where the Messiah is to be born so I can worship him too. The Antichrist will come on the scene saying peace and safety and, claim, and seem to be a friend to those who want to worship God. But it's a lie. It's a lie. Number three, here, Herod ended up standing against Christ and went after the Son of God to kill him. So the Antichrist will go after the children of God and seek to put them to death. Number four, Herod had all the political powers of the the greatest army that had ever been seen, the Roman legions at his disposal. The Antichrist, it says, will rule the world for 42 months. And it says, who will be able to make war with him? He'll have the greatest army at his disposal. Number five, just as Herod, well, uh, just as Herod failed to destroy Christ, and God protected Jesus, remember? He led them out of that area. So it's awesome for those who have ears to hear and eyes to see and are watching the prophetic and what's going on. When they see the abomination of desolation stand in the holy place and they're not deceived into thinking, oh, this must be God's rule, which many will be deceived. Those who see that will be able to be protected and they'll know to run into the wilderness and hide. And God, we've seen, will protect them, will nourish them. Now, God may have you as a believer. He might want you to go from city to city and preach the gospel. I don't know how he's going to lead you, but just make sure you're being led by him. Amen. You're not following false signs and wonders that are being done under the Antichrist because it says Jesus warned that there will be false Christ and false prophets and they shall show great signs and wonders. So much, so much that if possible, they'll deceive the very elect of God. Watch out for signs and wonders movement that claim to be from God but aren't pointing to the scripture but are pointing to experience because it says that the Antichrist comes in 2 Thessalonians 2 with all power and signs and lying wonders and all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved but they're given over to the strong delusion that they might believe a lie. God sends them a strong delusion because they had pleasure in wickedness and they did not love the truth. Be a lover of truth. If you're not a lover of truth, you will be deceived, man. If you don't love the truth, you will be deceived. Next, praise God, we have protection. 
Herod suffered a horrible death. According to Eusebius, the historian, uh, Herod the Great became sick immediately after he sought to kill the baby boys in Bethlehem. He had terrible craving to scratch himself continually. Uh, his intestines were ulcerated and his private parts became infected. And he suffered during convulsions and died a horrible, painful death. The Antichrist, it says in Revelation, will be taken. Uh, and so will the false prophet when Jesus Christ returns. And their bodies will be given over to the flame to be burned, it says in the book of Daniel. And also in Revelation, it says they'll be sent to the lake of fire before everybody, anybody else is sent to the lake of fire. The beast and the false prophet, the Antichrist, and his false prophet are sent there. I praise God, man. I'm not looking, personally, you know, I'm not looking from Santa, for Santa Claus to come from the North Pole, man. I'm looking for Jesus Christ to come back, man. I praise God for his first coming, but the fact that his first coming was successful and he died for our sins means there's a second coming, Amen. And he's not coming back with a bunch of reindeer. The Bible says he's coming with the armies of heaven, amen, with all the angels and with all the saints, amen. And he doesn't need Rudolph to light the way, man, because it says that his face shines like the noonday sun in all of its strength, man, and it'll be dark throughout the world. But when he comes back, because it says the sun will not give its darkness and the, the moon will not, give, um, will not give its light and the moon will not give its light and everything will be dark. But when he comes back, it says it'll be like lightning shining from the east to the west <laughs> because he'll light it up, man. He's coming back. And he says when he comes back, he's not, it's not a list that he's checked once and he's got to check again because he knows all things. He's going to reward us, it says, according to our works. If you're saved, you're saved by grace. You're going to heaven if you trust in Jesus. But you'll be rewarded based on what you've done. Amen? That's the one that we're looking for. However, when we keep our mind in the prophetic, we have to keep in mind that there is a huge deception going on. Because Jesus said there'd be another one that comes to deceive. He said, I've come in my Father's name in the Gospel of John, and you receive me not. If another one comes in his own name, him you will receive. So the Antichrist will not come to glorify the Father. In fact, it says he'll blaspheme God in heaven. He'll come in his own name, and he'll exalt himself as God and want to be worshipped as God. Second Thessalonians 2. There's a huge deception right now where the world is being conditioned to receive the Antichrist. We're being conditioned that we need numbers and computers to buy or sell, and, and we're being conditioned uh, that we're all supposed to just agree with each other even though we might, some of might have a totally messed up view of God, we're supposed to act like it's right. The world is being set up to stop the seed. Did I hear a wow back there? Isn't this so, do you see what's going on? Raise your hand if you see what's going on here. Right now, we need to praise God that the seed has come into the world, the Lord Jesus Christ, amen? <laughs> praise God, give him glory. Let us stand up, because we're at the end. Praise God. we got an awesome God, you guys, and praise God that Jesus was born in the world. Praise God he's coming back. And as they pass out the cup and the bread, this is something you need to understand. The list that Jesus is checking, it's called the Book of Life. And in Revelation chapter 20, it says this. Verse 11. It says, then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. Now earth and heaven flee, and everybody's at the throne of God, the great white throne judgment of God. Then I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were open. Another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged from the things which were written in it, in the books, according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and, the, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name, verse 15, was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. You need to make sure that your name, if you want your name on any list, it needs to be on this list. Amen? You need to make sure it's in the book of life because the Lord's going to open the book of life and those names that will be there will be the ones who have been cleansed of their sins. Those who have taken Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Amen? Those who have asked for mercy from God. Those who have recognized that God became man and that he died for our sins. Those, if you want to be in that book, the book of life, you need right now to make sure that you've turned from your sins and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Because that's who he's coming back for at his second coming. And praise God, even if the Antichrist was able to kill us, which he'll kill many people, praise God. Because the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord, amen. 
so we could keep our heads up. Jesus said, when you see these things happening, lift up your heads for your redemption is drawing near. There's a lot of deception out there and the world is being conditioned, guys. We need to stay in God's word so we know the truth, amen? True peace, true love, true unity only happens when we're in submission to God. And the Bible says, peace to all those who are rule, who go by this rule, meaning that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's the only way we can have real peace. And I pray that you'd have a blessed Christmas and I pray that you would think of the bigger picture that yes, Herod tried to kill baby Jesus. That's because there's a spiritual war and there's a prophetic war, but it means so much more than what happened 2,000 years ago. It has prophetic significance for our lives now because he has come and died and rose again, amen? And for the future because he's coming back again, amen? Jesus Christ is coming to town, amen? Praise God. Let's bow our hearts before God. We want to thank you for joining us today at Blessed Hope Chapel. We hope you're edified by the service. Uh, Our main hope and prayer for you is that you would know the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would have eternal life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He said, I have come that you might have life more abundantly, but the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, enter the straight gate, for broad and spacious is the way that leads to destruction, and many go that way. But straight and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few are those who find it. Our hope and prayer is that you'd be among those who find it, that you'd find eternal life in Jesus Christ. We thank you again for joining us. Have a beautiful week. God bless you till next time.